depending on what kind of uh, organization you're in, say you're a, man, a bank, for instance, someone like the local government will is issue laws about how you can do business, about the amount of capital you must have, uh, all kinds of things. But they also have regulations about the way you make software and how you manage IT risk. So these regulations are something you're obliged to, um, to implement in order to get your banking license. And the way it works is you take these regulations and somehow you translate them into processes. And this is something that's happened over years usually. Um, you come up with different kinds of ways uh, of making sure that you follow your IT change processes. Because eventually, the local authorities, the government, the financial services authority will come in and say, well, how do you meet the regulations? And you show them your process documents. And then they say, OK, now you have to prove to me that you're following what you say you're doing. And then it's usually a lot of going through the documents, going through the, the different systems to find this information. It's not just uh, regulated industries that have these challenges. There's a lot of organizations that make medical devices, automotive software. They're obliged to follow standards also. Um, so it's the same problem, but just in a different domain. Uh, and what you learn is that by adding a having these kind of checklists, it does help you improve your quality. Now, where it comes in, in reality in your organization for a software developer is right in the middle of the, the value stream. Because first of all, you have to figure out whether it's even legal to make this feature. For instance, uh, do we, are, are we obliged to tell the customers about these changes? Do we need to get in touch with uh, the legal departments? The, there's usually an awful lot of process around the product management, around the requirements. And at the other end of the spectrum, you also have a lot of uh, processes around, for instance, how you do network security, how you do backup and disaster recovery, and so on. But in the middle is the place that's, that, that, that I'm most interested in, because I'm a software developer, and I'm, I'm, much more, uh, I'm very curious about how we solve this problem. Now, the way it's usually done in organizations is, is, is a lot of pro, uh, paperwork and process. So you have things like change advisory boards, where in order to get a change into production, you would gather people from IT, from uh, risk, from uh, compl internal compliance and the development teams to look at the changes and make sure all the testing has been done. Uh, and they go through a lot of checklists. Now, the problem with this process is that it's slow. It's really, really slow. And Tim Ottinger talks about software process is really a software prevention process, and that's really true. If you look at the traditional ways of managing uh, software process in regulated industries, it, it's a lot and a lot of um, basically process around stopping you getting that change into production. So he says if you want to prevent code delivery, what you should do is add batches and silos and queues, approvals and gates. But these are exactly the things that you're obliged to add if you're working in a regulated industry, you're obliged to have controls. You're obliged to have gates. You're supposed to control the risk. But it does make it hard to deliver. So how do we get rid of batches, silos, queues, while staying compliant? Well, we're starting to figure a lot of this out in the greater industry is with DevOps. DevOps is a great way to remove a lot of the manual, repetitive steps that we need to do. And it's a social technical system. It involves bringing the people together, people from development and operations and security and whoever else, making sure that they're working together and talking together and building their skills, working across the value stream. But it's also a technical system because as well as people working together, you should be trying to automate as much of uh, the work as possible, especially the stuff that's repeated and uh, continuous. I especially like this um, diagram. This is from AWS, where they talk about uh, DevOps more like a, a typically the, the DevOps, uh, when, when it's uh, displayed in a diagram, people draw a circle or maybe the infinity thing. And I think this is a lot more realistic for the way it actually works in, in production, where you're trying to automate and make that pipeline to the customer as quick and fast and repeatable as possible. But then it's a, like a bi-directional pipe. On the way back, you want to get the monitoring information, the, the, the information about what's going on in production and bring it back into your systems. So DevOps has been great at solving a lot of this 
uh, challenge around uh, the manual paperwork and so on. But how does that fit into compliance? Well, the thing is, compliance is also a socio-technical system. Uh, it's just that a lot of organizations haven't figured this out yet. Compliance, especially internal audit, they're often in a very, very different part of the building, not part of the team. Um, and sometimes rightly so, in a sense that um, if you think about it, often banks will talk about the three lines of defense, where we're talking about defense against uh, IT risk and uh, non-compliance. Let's say is the first line is the, the people doing the work themselves. The second line is the internal audit teams in, in banks and financial organizations. And then the third line is the financial services authority. So it does make sense that you have some people that are on the outside. Now the problem is, if the people that are doing the compliance are not anywhere near to the teams doing the DevOps, it's very hard to, to, to solve this particular problem. So what, it is, what is it that you can use to bring these two uh, parts of the organization together? Well, obviously, this is a social technical thing. Have them talk to figure out what compliance controls must be implemented. But then there's also a technical component. And I think that the technical component is something we already know in software development. It's test-driven development. A specific branch of test-driven development is behavior-driven development, BDD. And Matt Wynn's got this great definition of it where it says, BDD practitioners explore, discover, define, and drive out the desired behavior of software using conversations, examples, and tests. And I think we can apply that same process, exactly the same process that um, you bring with behavior-driven development to the world of compliance. And what that would look like is getting the, the compliance, obviously, it covers lots of different areas. You have uh, security, you've got change management, you've got uh, internal audit, and so on. If you get all the people that are involved in creating controls for your risk, you can start to define them with examples. For instance, when a current branch is a pull request and there's no review, when the merge build is run, then you should fail the build. That's a concrete example that you can discuss with IT, with internal audit, with compliance and see if they agree with this. Have just a very simple text. And then you can start to build out your control framework, which is, in the essence, just a test suite defining in plain language that everyone in the business can understand what compliance controls you must implement. Now, BDD goes a step further and says, well, once you have these examples, once you've got people talking together and are agreed on the way to do it, you can start to automate the, the tests as well. And what kind of controls you might come up with are things like code reviews must be implemented, coding standards must be followed, verifiable builds, test coverage, static analysis, vulnerability scanning. All of this stuff is things that you can test for automatically. Once you've defined your criteria, you can take those controls and automate them. And the best way to do that is with a, a unit testing framework. It's a fantastic tool for defining tests that you want to run as part of your pipeline. It gives you standard reporting and transparency, explanations on the failure, um, control test independence. So if one compliance uh, control fails then, and all the other ones pass, then you can see what, exactly how you're, you're out of compliance. And of course, it's, it's very, very easy to implement with your, integrate with your CI processes. Um, so ING's done a lot of this work as well over in, in Holland. They've, they've got some great talks about how they've automated compliance in their pipelines. Google in December had a, a very, very interesting talk about how they have a very similar system which they call BAB, uh, Binary Authentication for Borg, which is um, an automated con uh, compliance control before code goes into production. They're doing this to, to kind of suppress the risk of insiders. Uh, getting code into production. And it runs exactly like a, a unit test framework where you're checking the policies, and if, if the policies pass, then you make it to production. And using all of these techniques, if you automate your controls, run them in your pipeline, have them part of your deployment process, then it's a way for you to build the trust in, throughout the organization that you can go faster still with the control you need. So thank you. <laughs>